Hello, I'm Robert and this is the Robert Inventor channel on YouTube. I'm just going to show you this rhythm. So, first of all, I play both parts separately to help you to hear it when they're played together. So, left hand side is going. And I'm playing it on jam jars. It's a kind of found music, you know, playing with bits and pieces of things you find lying around. And uh, just the. Uh, it's on bubble wrap because of the different kind of sound you get. Like there, it sounds rather nicer on the bubble wrap. So, and then on the right hand side, I'm doing like that. But I paint them together with each other in a rather unusual way. So now listen to hear what they sound like played together. where I started again. So um, the rhythm I was playing there, I was playing uh, five beats with the left hand side to four beats on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, my five beats, I was doing four sounds for the five beats. So the five beats, in, so it's basically it's a five-four polyrhythm, but with only four sounds on the left hand side cycling around. So it's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one. So the one comes on a different sound each time around. And on the right hand side, it's the same, but it's four, uh, with just three sounds. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, like that. And then, uh, so then I play the two together. And uh, so I'm just going to talk and talk a little bit about this polyrhythm, what it is, you know, a little bit more about it. Uh, this rhythm anyway, uh, I see the one question is whether you call it a polyrhythm or what you call it. But uh, uh, whatever you call it, and we'll talk a little bit about how you practice it, why it's useful, what it's good for, and how it relates to practicing polyrhythms generally. So, uh, first of all, uh, let's look at how you practice it. <coughs> at least how I practice it. Uh, so hopefully, if, uh, I imagine this is probably quite new to you, this polyrhythm, this kind of rhythm. So if you haven't played this particular rhythm before, then maybe a few tips might be helpful. So, so what I, the way I practice it is I start off with a 5-4 polyrhythm, just play just normal 5-4 polyrhythm. And I'm assuming you can do that uh, if, you, if you don't have some approximation to a 5-4 polyrhythm to get started. Well, I'm going to talk about that towards the end of this. So to do the five, you start with your five four polyrhythm and you just, so that's bass. Now there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding and confusion about these rhythms as to what people are talking about. So what I'm talking about here is I'm um, talking about by polyrhythm I mean the uh, same measure in both sides. So I do one, two, three, four, five, one and the same bit you do a little bit slower tempo obviously. One, two, three, four, one. And then when the two come together, the ones are together on every single measure. So. Cut. So I'm playing five beats there, at the same time as four beats there. So uh, that's what I mean here when I'm talking about a, a polyrhythm. And the other sort of thing, rhythm that you get, the more uh, you often come across is a polymeter, which is uh, when you have the same, it's strictly it's a beat preserving polymeter, where you have the same beat size in both rhythms. So we can do that as well with these three and four, the simple way, just keep going around the four, keep going around the three with exactly the same beat size on both sides, and you get something like this. So I'm doing threes on the right and doing fours on the left, and they've all got the same beat size, the measures are different sizes on the left and on the right, 
so it takes a while, they don't come together in the same place, and eventually they keep on going long enough to come together and we come back in the same place where we started. So this is a 3-4, this is 4-4, the same size quarter bit on each side. And that is a polymeter, a simple polymeter. And a bit per certain polymeter. Now the uh, the confusion is that in popularly both of those are often called polyrhythms. And then when you could read the scholarly papers about it, then both of them are called polymeters. So the scholars tend to call everything polymeters, at least the ones I've read. And the polyrhythm and the um, in popular talk tends to call everything polyrhythms and lump them all together. But uh, the scholars would say that it's a polymeter preserving the beats, is what the popularly sometimes called polymeters and the polyrhythm preserving, a polymeter preserving the measures. So both sides play the same measure, that's what is popular terms is often called a polyrhythm. Uh, but it's quite a useful distinction, except when you come to a rhythm like we've just, I've just played, in which uh, neither of those is preserved. And not if you think about it as the four sounds. And so it's got both features of a polyrhythm and, and features of a polymeter. And I call it a mind-boggling polyrhythm, but that's just... Uh, you know, just for fun. I don't, I don't know if it's got a proper name at all. But uh, it's a very useful. And in fact, she, I came up with all the details of this, talking with uh, Facebook friend Nick Seawater. We were talking, he's speaking on polyrhythms, and we are talking about methods of playing polyrhythms. And uh, I already had the possibility of playing these kinds of rhythms, but came up with different ways of presenting them. You know, it was already in Vance Metronome, but came up with different ways of presenting them with them and practice them with them that help you with your ordinary polyrhythms. So, uh, so anyway, the uh, so the way to, uh, so now I'm just explaining how I practice this polyrhythm, and you know it's, it may seem simple enough in some ways. In some ways, it seems quite tricky. It took me. Um, two or three weeks before I could actually um, find myself able to play it. Uh, but uh, uh, some people will surely manage that more quickly. I'm mainly a programmer and this is something I do for fun. But uh, anyway, but don't be surprised if it takes a little while to get to, to, to do it, even if you're used to polymers. So, uh, so now the way that you, I practice it anyway, is to practice one hand at a time. So I'm assuming you can play a 4-5 polyrhythm. So you play 5 there, 4 there, and then so you just start playing. Wait a minute. So you do that, but now just do the same, but start moving around. And then notice how the measure starts in a different place each time we go around. And then you do the same on the right hand side, just the right hand side. Like that. And you try and keep the beats very steady. Um, there are a few glitches there, sorry, but you try and keep them as steady as possible on uh, both sides. And that's your um, practicing it that way. Now, and then finally you do them both together. And then it's doing them both together is when it gets a little bit um, uh, tricky and, and it's not, it's, if you think about it, there's nothing very complicated you're really doing, but you just tend to get confused, you forget where you are in the middle. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, the thing, one thing that I find helpful is arranging them, arranging whatever you're hitting in a circle like this. So I've got one, two, they've got the mix in a circle, and like that as well. And uh, I find that is much more helpful than like laying them out in a straight line. It somehow seems to help, make it very easy to, you know exactly where to go, you just keep on going around the circle. It's a little bit more tricky if you go that, that, that maybe to a different motion back, which is a longer motion of your, your whatever you're hitting with as well. Whereas here all the motions are roughly the same size. So it's, it's, it's just one less thing, one extra little bit of help. You want to make it as easy as possible for yourself because they're quite tricky anyway. And it also helps to keep it steady. So now, now, um, first of all, how do we notate these rhythms? So uh, uh, the 
ordinary polyrhythm notation, four call and five kind of thing, is not going to work here. So, uh, um, and normally polyrhythms are notated if you do a kind of score or something, unless you're just doing for piano where you, know, you, you might notate it as triplets or quintuplets or whatever in one hand over the other hand. But it's very common for the for polyrhythms to notate using just quarter notes for both parts. So you might have your clarinet playing 5-4 and your trombone playing 4-4 four, four, and the 5-4 is played, their measures and it's played at the same time as the 4-4. Four, four. So the quarter notes are different, are different. Um, it's like it's played at a slightly faster tempo. So the quarter notes are played at different speeds. So that's one way of notating polyrhythms, which is very common. But uh, the uh, uh, Brian Fernyhow, he came up with another way, another notation. Well, he, he came uh, uh, for, for notating things where you have several rhythms going on at once. And what he uses is fifth notes and seventh notes and things like that, which you normally get, don't get in music at all. And so the idea there then is that, uh, f that obviously a fourth note, then four fourth notes make a whole tone. Well, five fifth notes make a whole tone. Then you can use the same size whole tone for both parts. So then the uh, 5 over 4 would be written as 5 over 5 because the clarinet in that case was playing 5 fifth notes instead of 5 fourth notes. So that makes it much easier to notate this sort of thing. So, so because now what we can say is we're playing 4 over 5 in the left hand. And uh, so you've got 4 fifth notes and you've got 3 over 4 in the right hand, quite straightforward. It's three quarter notes. And the entire measure on the right hand is three quarters of a whole tone. The entire measure on the left hand is four fifths of a whole tone. So the measures are different in size. The beats are also different in size. So it's combining characteristics of both uh, a polyrhythm and of a beat preserving polymeter. And a music scholar would just call this a polymeter, but what else you would call it, I'm not quite sure, because nothing's being preserved in the two sides in any obvious way. Um, so, so it's, uh, but just expect just to notate it using the vine funny notation. So it's four, five, colon, three, three, four. Four, five, played simultaneously with three, four. And that's what we're playing. Now, uh, so now, yeah, I've talked about how to practice it and how to notate it. So now let's think about what else I want to talk about. So there's also uh, talk about, about why you do it. Motivation. So the motivation for doing this is all to do with um, the thing is that there's a great tendency when playing polyrhythms for one of the two rhythms to be primary and the other one to be secondary and so not really a full independent rhythm in its own right. When you're playing, I mean, it's not intended, but as a performer, then that's very likely to happen. And, um, and then the other thing that's likely to happen is slightly inaccurate timing. So it doesn't really sound like you're playing a slightly different rhythm, which is a good approximation to a polyrhythm, but isn't really the proper polyrhythm. So this uh, method of practicing is one of the best things you can do to try and keep the rhythms independent of each other so they both sound like they complete rhythms in their own right and to keep the beat, be able to play the beat very steady. It's not that the beat has to be steady but you have to feel that they are uh, two separate rhythms going on not just one rhythm with some other beats sort of played on top of it at sort of miscellaneous positions in the measure. So. Uh, so now, the ways you practice polyrhythms, there's uh, two ways basically of doing it. There's the subdividing method, and then, well, there's three ways, and I'll come to them. But the subdividing is what most people are most familiar with. So the subdividing method, I'll show this with three, two. So uh, you would count one, two, three with that hand, and with this hand, you come in on the hand between the two and the three. So you go, one, two, and three. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Dead easy to do. Now, uh, but the problem is that with, if you're doing that, you're, this is the primary, this is the secondary, and you may well feel that this is secondary. 
and uh, it's especially more noticeable to listen now for more complex rhythms but yourself as a performer you may feel that this is the primary rhythm especially if there's a melodic line or something and that this is or some, some, something a little bit more going on than just that then you might feel that that is the secondary rhythm and so to help with that you can practice it both ways so then you can practice this with the two beats here and this you can't just one hand up so you go one and uh, two and uh, three sorry one one and uh, two and uh, one and uh, two and uh, one so then that is again the three two now this is the primary and this is a little bit secondary and you may have felt that the three on this side was feeling sub somewhat subservient to the two when you're listening to that so uh, so that's the uh, two ways of playing 3-2, but ideally you want both rhythms to have the same level of importance, the same kind of, in, they're independent of each other, they're both uh, really rhythms in their own right, and neither of them is the primary one. They're both going on, each doing its own thing, and but also meshing together as well. So that's, uh, and that is to say, you know, polyrhythms maybe don't have to be like that, but I'm assuming that you're wanting your polyrhythms to be like that. So, so this is all to do with if you want your rhythms to be very independent of each other. So, uh, so now the next, the other way of practicing, so with the subdivisions method, you try practicing one way, then you practice the other. And then, quite a nice thing to do, once you've got used to them, is to count both of them as the whole numbers instead of subdivisions. So then you would go one, two, two, three, one, two, two, three. And then you can maybe go one, two, two, three, one, two, two. So the higher pitch ones were two and lower pitch ones were the three. So, uh, so that way you can count both rhythms simultaneously except of course unless you're able to sing two notes at once you know you, you can't sing two ones simultaneously but you know what I mean so uh, so so that's the uh, that that can help you to give equal emphasis to the, give the equal importance to the two rhythms uh, but even so the subdivisions method is quite it's quite hard to use at speed and it's like a scaffolding and it's a little bit if you rely on it too much, then you can get a little bit difficult to remove the scaffolding once you, once, once you, uh, once you. So all, of all these methods have their advantages and their disadvantages. But, uh, but anyway, so that's the subdivisions method, and it's what most people, way most people practice polyrhythms probably. The uh, so then the other method is another method, which isn't much talked about. Is well, I mean, actually, come to think of it. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, you've come across it anywhere, but uh, but it's it's kind of obvious in a way once we think about it in a particular way. I have to do a bit of a bibliography to uh, see if people talk about rhythms like this. But the, it's the uh, it's the beat drifting poly approach. So you have the steady click there, and then you have the uh, the your taps there of this polyrhythm that you're playing with it which is going to drift through the click and this approach is actually the subdivisions work best with very simple very low numbers like two three three four and four five is all right because you've got quintuplets if you're used to playing quintuplets then you may well find that four or five you can also do using subdivisions maybe you've got to do it both ways so one of the ways you will end up with quintuplets so uh, so, but when you get to more complicated things, you know, 7, 8 or something like that, uh, or if you want to do something like 8, 13 or whatever, then you might find the subdivisions method quite tricky to use. And uh, so now we've got the, the drifting through the beat approach, and that is uh, actually, in some ways, somewhat easier to use with the more complex polyrhythms. And especially if it's only one difference, like, you know, sort of, Seven, eight, eight, nine, or that sort of thing. So seven, call eight. I mean, of course. So uh, so the way that works, you play a steady click with this hand. And with this hand, 
you press steady, then you go a little bit later, a little bit later, a little bit later, and then eventually you approach it from the other side, and then you come together. So you're gradually drifting through the beat with that hand, while playing a steady beat with that hand, you're drifting later and later. And then to do it both ways, so we do that same uh, problem as with the subdivisions, that one is always primary to the other, uh, at least the naive way of doing it. So, so then if you you want to do it both ways, so then having done that, you now do this one drifting faster, getting further and further ahead, going, um, going, uh, uh, getting further and further ahead of the beat as you go through. So play a steady click on this side, get closer and further and further ahead with this one. So. And eventually you hit it again from the other side. So, so that's the drifting through the beat approach, and you just have a base, you get first play, so you're very comfortable playing anywhere in the beat. So this is a thing you can practice first, then get used to drifting through the beat, and then drifting through the beat in a steady way, and you will be playing polyrhythms at that stage. The only thing is that you're, you're not quite sure what polyrhythm it is that you're playing until you hit the click. So you have to get used to how fast you have to drift through the polyrhythm in order to get to the click at the right point. And with some of the polyrhythms, you need to bounce, uh, jump over the next beat. So you know, something like 5-7, you need to go over it. You don't want to hit it the first time around because there's two beats difference between the two numbers. So you would, you would, you would drift through the beat and then instead of hitting it next time around, you would jump over it, you would play the next beat after it, and then go around and eventually hit it the next one after that. Uh, uh, if, if what I'm saying doesn't make too much sense, don't worry, because if you try it out, then that's what you will find will happen. The easiest ones to get started with anyway are things like 4, 5, 5, 6, where they just differ by 1. So the, so the drifting through the beat has the advantage that you aren't thinking in terms of lots of subdivisions. It's rather simpler, so, uh, and it's kind of maybe easier to really relax into it. But it has disadvantages as well, such as it's easy to sort of find yourself drifting into the wrong polyrhythm. So if you're playing 4-5 and then you change the drift a little bit too much, you find you're playing 5-6 instead of when you're meant to be playing 4-5, which is a thing that would never happen with the subdivisions method. And, and but the nice thing about the drifting again, though, is that once you get used to it, you can play loads of different polyrhythms just by varying the amount of drift, which you can't do with the subdivisions approach because you just have to work out the subdivisions new for each polyrhythm that you try. Now, the, uh, the next thing, the other way, there's yet a third way of practicing polyrhythms, which in some ways is best of all, which is to just think of the, of the, of the amount of time in the measure, and so you've got your measure, and as a musician you're used to be able to divide any interval into four and probably into five and other numbers, like playing quintuplet. So you just got your measure, and you divide it into five with one hand, like that, and divide it four with that hand, right, and then you play both together, and you try and play both together, now I'm not going to play with this, so, something like that. So, uh, so but you, you just try playing, just play a four, and just play a five, and you come together at the end of it, and you just will, and then if you, if you can do that, then any, 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 anything that you can play as just any measure you can play. If you can play 7-4, and if you can play 5-4, then you can play a 7 chord and 5 polyrhythm. You can just play 7-4 there, 5-4 there, and make sure that both measures are the same size. And there you are, you've got it. Well, uh, it seems so simple, but it's not. As far as we know, it's not as simple as that. And, and, and nearly everyone has to start off by doing the subdivisions first. But there, is a, um, there are some nice ways of practicing this fine method. So one, one way of doing it, so getting used to just playing you know, one thing and the other and getting the measures to fit together, I find quite nice is, uh, it's difficult doing with two hands, but doing with your hands and your feet. And so when I'm going for a walk, you've got a steady beat. You just walk in a very steady way with your feet. And then you, you, if, you, you know, if you're somewhere where there's nobody much around, or if you don't mind looking a little bit silly, but you, you walk along. Now you want to have odd numbers on both, like with, uh, with, with the feet especially, because otherwise you will tend to get into an uneven rhythm because it's always the left uh, foot on the measure beat. But you just walk, and you, you do five, 
five um, steps with your feet and at the same time you've got to do say three or whatever the number is with your hand and just try to say without doing subdivisions without doing drifting just get used to how long it takes to to walk five steps and in that time try to clap three times and if you do that and then try clapping another time before you know seven or whatever so if you do that then that is like the third way of practicing where you just simply play your seven beats in the same time as the four beats without worrying about the subdivisions without worrying about the drifting it's just it is going to work out so long as you do that and that in some ways is the best if you want to have the independence of the rhythms but it's just difficult to do now the the reason for doing this exercise here one of the reasons why this particular one is particularly good is because it helps to deal with these issues of irregular timing in the two hands so uh, so if you if you think of this as being fundamental then this is to tend to be some kind of rhythm played over that then the, there's a great tendency to play not the actual proper polyrhythm but something as a kind of an approximation to it and and uh, 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 so, but th if you do this, then the sounds, these four sounds are coming in different places in this rhythm and different every time you go around, and different and also different places in the five. So, so there's an awful lot of kind of it's mixing everything up, and it's making much up more less likely that you'll kind of settle into bad habits that aren't quite right, because you're just mixing it up by moving the sounds around in a way that you don't, you don't really expect and it's kind of different from the underlying polyrhythm. And so anyway, I think those were the main things I wanted to talk about. Now this, I think this uh, video is probably going to run out quite quickly. I've got a camera that's got a half hour limit, so I think we're going to have to stop, stop quite soon. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, that's the main things that I was going to talk about. And you can use this with bounce metronome. And when you use it with bounce metronome, try following the visual bounces because they help with relaxation so your hand follows the visual bounces and also uh, with practicing polyrhythms especially it's very important to be precise so that your clicks if you're following a metronome that your clicks precisely merge with the metronome clicks so i've talked about that separately while you try playing ahead and behind the beat drifting through the beat and then you get used to a position that's between the head and behind and you click then you click to merge with the metronome click rather than uh, listing out for the metronome click listen out for the merge rather than for the metronome is a separate thing so uh, that uh, if you haven't seen that talk then you know what i'm saying that just now might be a bit mysterious but i'll add a link to this video is uh, the vanishing click so uh, so that helps you with relaxation helps with the precision precision is very important with polyrhythms because there are lots of rhythms that are almost the same as the polyrhythm that you're trying to play and just differ by a few milliseconds here and there and you it's very easy to snap into one of those wrong rhythms instead of playing the rhythm that you're trying to trying to play so if you are using if you practice the polyrhythm with the metronome do listen very carefully to the merge of your sounds with the click the metronome follow the bounces the visual bounces and all that will help with playing it precisely in both hands and then if you do that properly and start off very slow and then keep the precision all the way through then uh, the uh, 